and welcome to episode number four of What's Sex Got to Do With It? And again, we have my favorite great grandmother <laughs> in Arlington. Actually, it goes beyond that in the Boston region. You know, uh, Heather Renoff, Remoff, you know, and 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 we're so we're on chapter three, and chapter three is called Moving Right Along, and. Yeah, I think it's just going to be a pattern now. Why moving right along for chapter three? Um, discussing evolutionary speed, really, right. because uh, as as I read a book by Jonathan Lassos, and in it he had a line. Uh, he discovered evolutionary speed, how rapidly evolution happened in the species of lizard he was studying, and he had a line that, in which he said, "Darwin was wrong." <laughs> when evolution doesn't always process, uh, progress at snail's pace. When the conditions are right, it can happen almost overnight. That's not, a, the, you know, that's, I'm summarizing what right. he said. The part I remember was Darwin was wrong. And I thought, I've been waiting for 40 years to hear a respected scientist utter those words. Darwin was wrong. And he demonstrated how how rapidly evolution happened in the particular, could happen under certain conditions in the species of lizard he was uh, studying. And again, given that I believe that sexual, uh, sexual uh, reproduction as opposed to asexual reproduction really speeds up the rate of, of evolution, I was hooked and fascinated. Interestingly enough, he doesn't, I've never yet convinced him. We've been in an email exchange uh, of my take on sexual selection. He thinks the speed that he documented was due f to other reasons that I'm drawing a blank on, 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 on what he attributed it to. But uh, I, I suspect that he was looking at sexual selection in the same way as we discussed in one of our earlier sessions where researchers, because of Darwin's take on it, believing that sexual selection always resulted in sexually dimorphic traits, traits that were very different between the males and females of that species, that unless, unless um, mating produced that kind of dichotomy between the male and the female, it wasn't sexual selection. And I suspect that that's what the, what's the, the snag between Jonathan and me in discussing. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Evolutionary speed. Yeah. It almost like seems to be just a, um, what's the word for it, um, semantic, you know, issue. And the reason I say that is because, you know, uh, you discussed the Hardy Weinberg equation. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and once again, this is from the manuscript 61, 62, uh, where you're talking about selective breeding. And you said, think of it as sexual selection by proxy. <laughs> Viewed objectively, selective breeding is really nothing more than a rather f interesting form of what H Hardy Weinberg called assortative mating, or let me rephrase that, assortative mating, mating, and what I call sexual selection. You know. Yeah, uh, Darwin referred to that as artificial selection, and I say the only thing artificial about it is the fact that a species other than the one doing the reproducing is, 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 is making the, the sexual choice. Right. And Darwin himself was a pigeon fancier. Yeah. So he bred pigeons for ex all kinds of exotic traits. Obviously, very quickly, he could modify the appearance of a, of, of a pigeon, but he wasn't really thinking of that as sexual selection because he was the one. Of course, right. the sexual selection of a man was doing it also, right. making the choices. But in fact, it's, the, it's, it's just the difference in who gets born. Right, 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 yeah. right, 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 right. So, so it just makes me kind of wonder what is the block I mean, that people have in comprehending this. But for me, and, and this is why I'm really enjoying doing this series, is that I mean, this is kind of a, uh, a, a little, uh, what's the word? I want to say mystery story. It's not, uh, what's the word I use? Thriller. I mean, your I book is a, bit, is a thriller. I mean, <laughs> so you're, you're leading us somewhere. And, and you can almost see this as a little bit of a, a slow buildup, I mean, which is appropriate for evolution, you know, even though it goes faster than most people <laughs> think. I mean, it's still a slow buildup. So you're headed to a certain way. And we're going to get there, you know, I mean, but we're learning a lot. 
in the process. And what the, all I can say to people watching this is that he, we're really just getting the tip of the iceberg here. I mean, she gives so many um, interesting educational examples to back up I mean, uh, her statements. And even if you don't agree with the statements, I mean, the stories I mean, um, and the, the, um, the science that you are exposed to in the process I mean, is very much worth the reading. I mean, and, and one of the things that you talked about uh, and I think we mentioned this in the last episode, is how uh, you, what you dubbed the gene recognition theory of attraction, and in that how people with similar DNA, and, um, that of course differs by then what you get randomly, mm -hmm. and, are attracted to each other, and apparently and there was some research and, to back that up, that married couples and, have DNA that is more similar than you would um, fine randomly. Yeah, you know. yeah, more similar than would be predicted randomly. Yeah. Married couples, their DNA is, is more similar than you would predict yeah. randomly. Yeah. And you can sort of see, you know, we're, the human brain is, is actually not a skilled worker, <laughs> Len, yeah. but the human brain evolved to be really good at two things. One was reproduction and the other was survival. And quite frankly, it, we're better at reproduction than we are at survival. We're good at survival in, in the immediate, get right. out of the way of that lion. Right. But in terms of something coming at us like climate change, we're really good at denying that it's happening. Right. But reproduction, we're good at. So it's understandable why people select for that which looks similar. To go back to our last discussion, because if you're drawn to creatures that are very different from yourself, you're not likely to have viable offspring. You know, we have to mate within our own species. And so that the trigger is, oh, this creature is like me. And so as everything humans do, we take it to extremes, we take it to more, to excess. And so we tend to be drawn to people that I, what I used to dub as the gene recognition theory right. of attraction. The first book I wrote, the editor took that out of there, feeling that it could have racist interpretations. That is not my intent. Oh, and, that's uh, funny. I hadn't yeah. really thought about that. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right. Um, and, yeah. and that is not my intent because yeah. skin color is, is the tip of the iceberg. Women look at so much more yeah. than, than the immediate appearance. That's but, funny. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, it's, yeah, you have yeah. to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting, yeah. You know, so, huh. um, yeah, uh, and, and I was, well, you explained, you didn't actually answer the question I was going to ask. So since we have a limited amount of time, I'm not going to ask it. You know, <laughs> we'll just move on and, and, and um, talk about something that if you take that to its logical extreme, or not extreme, but push it a little bit, and then you get into why it is that I mean, people who are related I mean, don't I mean, have relationships. And you talk about negative imprinting. Yes. And, um, and so do you want to expand on that? Yeah, that bit? That's completely fascinating yeah. to me. There was a gentleman who did research on the on the kibbutz. I'm drawing a blank on his first last name. A first name, his last name was Sheffer. And he, children that were raised communally in the kibbutz, of course, their parents would love it if they grew up and married each other. Right. And in fact, he could document almost no marriages right. that occurred between children who were reared together at a certain age. And so just the proximity of, of siblings being together in that critical period, there was negative imprinting for romantic attachment. So that's from that's, zero to six. I, I, you, yeah. you, you, it's, it's. I think that yeah. sounds right. I don't remember the exact, yeah. the exact age. I have it right. in the book. Right. But like so many things I have in the book, you know, I've taken right. notes and then I, right. I move from my notes to the book and I don't. Yeah. Oh, but I think yeah. zero to six sounds right. Yeah, huh. But children that were reared together during that period. In, in the kibbutz, just did not marry. But what was even more interesting, I found, was that you said that even the children of the children who were had the negative imprinting still didn't connect with each other, right? I don't. I. I. I I'm not as certain on that. Okay. Len, so but it's the children who were reared together for sure. There was negative imprinting. The the children of the children that data, I think, is more inclined to epigenetic 
inheritance. Uh, so I was just going to read, so I'm going to read okay. maybe. Read, you know, read, yeah. So it's like, what about the kids who grow up in communal peer groups? Joseph Shepard, yeah. author of the study on incest avoidance and negative imprinted, imprinting, reports that among 2,769 marriages contracted by second generation adults in all kibbutzim, there were no cases of intra-peer group marriage. Yeah, the second generation, just that's not the children of the original, but he, he means people who were second generation born on the kibbutz, not is what he's meaning there. It is the children who were reared together who have negative imprinting, not their children. We're reading that differently. Okay. Yeah, so let me, so I'm being a little slow here. And no, no, you're so, not no, being no, so. I uh, might not have, I might not have quoted so, it as so, clearly as I should So once again, by second generation, you mean? Uh, like their parents had been on the kibbutz. Right. And, and so they're the second generation of the kibbutz. Their kids who oh, were oh, born so on they're the, the ones who they're, Yeah, they're the ones. Yeah, their parents were kibbutz. And then the children of parents who already lived on the kibbutz. Those are the sec that's the second and generation. And so those are the ones that the, would experience the the negative neg imprint. Negative imprint. Okay, all right, all right. Because yeah, yeah. no, if it was that, then their children no. somehow avoided being... No, no, it's uh, not their children. Because no, that, that would be an children. interesting form yeah. of, of epigenetic. Yeah, yeah no, uh, uh, no, it's, uh, this, this is not epigenetics. This, well, is, this is just straight negative imprinting. Yeah, okay. Oh. Great, great. Well, well, viewer, I hope you enjoyed her unconfusing me on that one. You know? <laughs> so, 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 but so. what I yeah. find fascinating yeah. are, and what I think I mentioned in that this chapter, is given sperm donation, siblings who are reared apart yeah. and don't even know they're related, if they meet as adults, tend to be very strongly attracted to each other because, right. again, they recognize that right. similarity that I call gene but they haven't been reared together. And I joked when I first became aware, you know, of the number of, uh, of babies that are conceived via sperm donation that they ought to tattoo on the heels of the kids the, the number of right. their sperm donor right. because they're, they're anecdotal stories that crop up in the newspapers oh, yeah. every now and then of, of couples that meet, fall madly in love, and then learn their right. siblings. Right, right, and right, that's right. again that because yeah. there hasn't been that negative imprinting of, of children reared together. Right, right, and, and, and actually above the section that we just discussed, we you talk about a, that New York Times article that caught your attention. The headline was first I met my children, <laughs> then I, then my girlfriend. They're related, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so so this is a situation where you know so so I guess. Well, why don't you tell me a story? I mean, I have it highlighted here. I mean, but if you do, okay. No, I'm going to try to. He was a cab driver, right? Right. Who'd made? Who'd done sperm donations right. as a way to enhance his income? Right. And um, what was the headline first? I met my children, children then, then my girlfriend. girlfriend. They're related. Yeah, they're related. He uh, he met his children who wanted contact right. with with their biological father. Right. And of course, in the course of meeting those children, he met their mother. Right. And she, she fell hard for him. Right. In part because he exhibited behavioral mannerisms, et cetera, that her children had, the people she loved most right. in the world. He was so much like the people that she loved most in the world that she fell in love with him. Yeah. Uh, I, I just found that completely fascinating. Yeah, Again, it is. Uh, you yeah. know, it, he was so much like his biological kids yeah. that she found him irresistible. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, that is fascinating, you know, and, and um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to point that out because that was, and once again, as I said, I mean, there those kind of tidbits and the, in the book, I mean, that if you don't know about them, I mean, they're really quite, quite fascinating. And, and I had a question here about, I mean, do you think the causality could work in the opposite direction? And at the point I wrote this question, it made sense to me. <laughs> and now it's like, what was it getting at here? And, but it was just something about, about and, I guess, I guess it could be a case of I me. Mean, them having mannerisms that she didn't like, but that's not the opposite direction. That's just a contrast to the mannerisms, you know, uh, 
But um, yeah, I just it's it's almost like reverse causality. I mean, it's just something. The, I there don't, it, there it is. Yeah. Uh, because she's not recognize, rec recognizing her own genes. She's recognizing the genes that exist in her children, in, in, in this man who happens to be their father. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. that is the point. Right, right, but, right. Len, I want to go yeah. back to something you said originally. When you first read my book, and I will always be grateful to you for your response when you first read it, you, you were so curious and so interesting and you described it as a mystery yeah. and that was really gratifying to me because I do my writing and thinking between disciplines right. between the discipline of anthropology economics linguistics and biology so I haven't fully absorbed the dogma of any one of those four disciplines and in order to present my challenge to Darwin, I needed my reader to know all the things that I've picked up right. in bits and pieces operating right. between disciplines. Yeah. And so when you say, and it was very gratifying to me, that you felt like I was leaving clues. Yeah. I was, yeah. because I wanted my reader to know everything I know. Right. And I know a lot of things on the surface, not right. necessarily right. in depth. And I wanted them to know them all at once, but you can't know them all at right. once. And so there was this, this sprinkling sort of breadcrumbs around. Uh, sprinkling breadcrumbs. Uh -huh. Here, uh -huh. here's a piece you're going to need later. Right, right, right. Incorporate this way of thinking. You're, this this will help you make sense of where I'm going in the end. Yeah. So um, thanks, thanks for wow. for making that. I thought, oh, good, I hope other people are able to read it the same way. Again, because of this anchor bias, it's so difficult to let go of the things that we believe to be true. I have the advantage of not having absorbed the doctrine from many of the fields that I find fascinating. For example, early on I talked about how oh, Robert Trivers had convinced me of how a female choice worked long before I read Charles Darwin. Right. So when I first read Darwin, I, uh, my anchor bias then was a way of looking at the world that Robert Trivers had given me, right. which was not Darwin's way of looking at the world at right. all. Right. So when Darwin is talking about um, female choice, I'm more looking at it the way Trivers did. So right. oh, that, but anyhow, to get back to just scattering, scattering little tidbits and right. thinking, hold on to this, this is interesting. Right. You may need this information yeah. later. Now, this is perhaps basic, and maybe just a quick internet search would tell me this, you know. Uh, but I'm going back to the negative imprinting. What, what is that exactly? What, what is negative imprinting? I mean, what causes it? Well, in, I mostly don't think in terms of cause as much as I think of successful outcome. It prevents inbreeding that might be you understand that? Yeah. But I'm really interested in the cause. So well, we don't know the cause of it. Really, uh, well, it, to me, things evolve if they result in a, in a favorable yeah. outcome. You yeah, understand. But I understand. it doesn't, you don't no, I, necessarily yeah, start no, with the intent to get there. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, no, but this is really a technical question because I'm really interested in like what's, what's, what is negative imprinting. I mean, well, I, mean we, I understand it, what the results from it, but I'm trying to understand like what is it that causes the negative imprinting because the, the dynamic of that the, is like, does that have some application beyond the imprinting? Does it reveal something else about the way the brain works? Well, you know, you know we're uh, familiar, uh, I think, uh, we, yeah. many biologists, uh, and I'm not, you know, my degrees are not in biology, uh, are familiar with the work of Conrad Lorenz and his gray, gray like geese and the imprinting, uh, uh, many species of fowl yeah. imprint positive imprinting right, yeah. on the first creature they see when they hatch right. because that would be beneficial. It happens right, to right. be their mother and she's going to do all the things that are appropriate to right. that species. In the case of Conrad Lorenz and his gray line geese, he was the first thing they saw yeah. when they hatched. And so he treated them like they treated him as if he yeah. were their parent, their mother, right. they followed him everywhere, etc. Yeah. When we were kids, again, because I was around so many animals when right. I was young, yeah. um, we put 
uh, duck eggs under a setting hen yeah. because we wanted ducks. It was the cruelest thing we could have done, first of all. Chicken eggs hatch in 21 days, duck eggs take 28. So that poor hen is sitting there for an extra week. Uh -huh. And she, you know, she hears the peeping in the eggs. There's obviously a live. She's not going to abandon the nest. Right. But she's hanging in for a week more than would yeah. be normal. We lived on a property with a stream. Yeah. The minute those baby ducklings hatched, they headed for the stream, went in and started swimming. There was a strong instinct. Poor hen almost had a heart attack. She, try, you know, yeah. they don't swim. She's pacing up and down, yeah. wading up to her ankles, and actually vomiting. She was so stressed yeah. that her ducklings went into the water. So, you know, that there, the 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 ducks could have positively imprinted on the hen and followed her behavior. But there was an instinct in them that overrode that positive imprinting, yeah. and they headed yeah. right for the water. Yeah, I find with my godson, we hatched a little egg in an incubator when he was a little yeah. guy because he was a city kid and right. had no exposure. And, of course, when that chick hatched, it imprinted on Tyrone. Yeah. And I, he took it to his class right. to show the other kids, and I explained yeah. to the kids about imprinting, and right. I said, the a cool chick thinks Tyrone is his mother. He quickly said, no, no, he thinks I'm his father. Right, right, right. But in fact, that chick was strongly imprinted on, right. on Tyrone because he was the first first thing that the chick saw when right, it right. hatched. So yeah, that's positive right, imprinting. That's positive. I mean, I'm really just into the negative. So I'm going to end up doing some research on this. Because I mean, to me, it's like, what is it that causes negative imprinting? And the, the notion that's coming to mind is that familiarity breeds contempt. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I really kind of want to understand that mechanism because I think if we can get in to figure out like, what is it that's causing people to do the negative imprint, it may give us some sense as to emotional development, you know, because, because, I mean, negative, we see so many examples of positive imprinting, it seems like there may be fewer of negative imprinting, but maybe there are, and we're just not aware of it because we don't focus on it. Well, so, I mean, Joseph Sheffer's yeah. work in the kibbutz yeah. was my first exposure yeah, to it, uh -huh. and I found it fascinating because I'd always wondered about the in incest taboo, and it, it does seem to be cross-cultural, yeah. and I thought, wow, anything that is that's, that taboo is so strong, even cross-culturally, it probably has, it's probably biological in origin. And he explained the mechanism for it, uh, a critical period in which exposure to... Yeah, yeah. well, he describes it, yeah. but so far I've not seen an explanation. Okay, but, you're going to research but, it, then we, you we, let we, me know, we, we then. We <laughs> okay. get back to it. So, yeah. so, um, um, so I think we're really going to draw this chapter to a uh, close. So if there's something else you want to say about chapter three, I'm going to let you have... The last word while I maybe try and scan for a quick sentence to end it yeah, on. Well, you can can scan. I, I you know, as I, because it's all so familiar to me, having written the book, I, unless I look at the notes I took before I came up today, I forget exactly which things are in which chapter. I but, got uh, you. Yeah, no, I totally get that. You know, so, so um, I think we're just going to end it there and say that uh, we have another exciting chapter coming up. And, and, and I'll give people a little bit of a tease uh, for it. And it's called Female Choice and the Origin of Man. And, and so <laughs> join us me for chapter four. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks, Lynn.